Number seven ministries. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because He has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom to the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind and to release the oppressed number seven ministries Today's sermon is called The River of Jordan. And that right there is actually a physical picture of the Jordan River. I've sat in church and people talk about all these, uh, these cities and these countries and I have no idea where they're at because me personally, geography is one of my weakest areas as far as knowledge. So this right here, you can see the Jordan River, it goes from... Uh, all the way up here, down to here, it goes uh, to the Dead Sea, right? It flows downward, and you see the Sea of Galilee, and I know most people have heard of the Sea of Galilee as, as well, and um, the Jordan River, it basically outlines Israel. <coughs> Jordan River basically outlines Israel. And here's some other... Uh, Cities that we know about, that we uh, hear about in the Bible quite often. Uh, Nazareth, we heard of Jesus, uh, the Nazarene. Uh, uh, you have Samaria. You have Gaza. Gaza is where they're always talking about the news, where the Muslims are lobbing over bombs over Israel. The Gaza Strip is right here. And then, does anyone know what's over here? Egypt. Egypt is over here. And then we have the Mediterranean Sea. Okay, this is just a little bit of uh, trivial information about the Jordan River. It rises in Lebanon. It runs, if measured on a straight line, not more than 136 miles. Israel in general is ridiculously small. For the huge impact that it has on the world, it's almost comical how tiny it is. And uh, it's saying that the, uh, the Jordan River is 136 miles from its highest source, uh, Mount Hermon, to the Dead Sea. And it runs through two lakes and the waters of Mormon, or Mermon, 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 and the Sea of Tiberias, and it descends 3,000 feet from its source to the Dead Sea. It is from 45 to 180 feet wide and has 27 important rapids between the Sea of Tiberias and the Dead Sea overflows its banks in the spring, although it's not quite 65 ms from the sea, and we're going to skip ahead. All right, and then the Dead Sea, what I found to be really interesting is the Dead Sea is the lowest place on earth, below sea level. It's the lowest place on the planet of earth. Did anyone know that? And it's also uh, one of the saltiest embodiments of water, the Dead Sea. It's so salty that people who can't even swim can go in the Dead Sea and it just causes them to flow. That's how salty it is. And literally, if you took um, a cup of the Dead Sea water in a cup, you would see salt just accumulating in the bottom of the glass. And so here you got a guy right here floating in the Dead Sea right now. You could tell he's just effortly, effortlessly floating in the Dead Sea. In Joshua chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Okay, so this assignment was not given to Moses. Even though Moses was one of God's chosen people, even though God used Moses to deliver the Hebrew slaves from bondage after all those years, and Moses brought them right up to a certain point, 
But God did not choose Moses to go over the Jordan River. He did his purpose. He did a few things that displeased God. And because of it, there was consequences. He was not allowed to go over the Jordan River. But it says that God chose Joshua, one of Moses' ministers or servants, to go over the Jordan River. And so basically on a practical purpose, you have a guy who was a leader, Moses. Everyone looked up to Moses. God used Moses to go to the Red Sea. The Red Sea split and everyone was focused on Moses. But yet Moses was still not allowed to go over the Jordan River to the promised land. And I think sometimes as Christians, on a practical note, sometimes we go to church and we look to the pastor, we look to the spiritual leaders, the people who God have chosen to preach the word, to lay hands on people, to pray, to do certain things. But sometimes God has other assignments that are equally as important or more important than the pastor he wants to use other people that work with the pastor and sometimes people will count themselves out and say well I'm not a pastor so God doesn't want me to use this or do this or have this ministry and that's not true God has a desire and a calling for his people and you don't have to have a certain title you don't have to have a certain position to have an important calling or job or duty for God to have for you so here again, you have the Jordan River. Joshua was called to pass over it, and that was into the promised land. So the Jordan River, in essence, it represents God's promises. And sometimes people will get right up to a certain place in their life, and they won't obtain the promises of God through disobedience, because that's what happened with Moses. And so we have to learn as Christians that there are consequences in this life for disobeying God and there are blessings from the hand of God, promises from God that we can obtain through obedience. And here we have Joshua chapter 3 verses 12, 13, and 17. Joshua. Okay, does anyone see the significance of what just happened? I had to read this a couple times before I really understood what it's saying. Does anyone understand what the, what the Bible's talking about right there, what the significant was? Okay, the Jordan River, obvious question, is wet or dry? It's wet. Okay, do you see how it says that the feet, it says that the feet of the priests, it says they passed over on dry ground. So basically, what God did is he performed another miracle, just like he did with the Red Sea splitting. But he did it with Joshua. And the, the 12 priests that God chose, the 12 priests, they were carrying the ark the Ark of the Covenant, and the Ark of the Covenant had certain uh, items that were significant throughout the Bible, and they were carrying this Ark, and they were going up to the Jordan River, and the Jordan River split, just like it did in the Red Sea. God performed a miracle, and the, the, the Jordan River split, and when the priests and the folks that were crossing the Jordan River, when they got on the other side, their, their feet were dry. Their feet were dry, which the Bible is saying that there was no water. They should have been soaking wet. In fact, I believe the Jordan River, it would have been a challenge to carry the Ark of the Covenant 
for water. And just to walk through a period. So you have God performing another miracle in the Jordan River. And God is doing the same thing over and over. From the Old Testament to the New Testament, God has chosen the Jordan River for an actual physical place to perform miracles. And so that tells me a few things. God has physical uh, chosen places that he's ordained miracles to be performed. And God, because he chose Joshua, you know what? Joshua saw Moses do all these great things at the hands of Moses. But now the baton is being passed from Moses to Joshua. And you know, that's a tough tough uh, shoe to fit. That's a tough pattern to follow. When you see someone great before you doing all types of miracles and being used of God, now that person dies and now it's on you. Well, you know God was using them, but how do you know us? A lot of times in our walk with God, when God calls us to do a certain thing, we become insecure. We question, God, are you really with me? God, how do I know you're with me? God, how do you know you want me to do this? God, are you sure? Me? With all my shortcomings, with all my fault, God, you know me. And Joshua needed to know that God was with them. Just as we do when God calls us to a certain point in our life to cross the Jordan River of our personal life, we need to know that God is with us. We need to know that God is going to perform a miracle just so we know for sure we're doing what he called us to do. And I'm going to tell you, when you're stepping out in faith, and you're being led by God, God will do miracles. He will do miracles, just as he did with Joshua. In 2 Kings chapter 2, verses 12, 13, and 14. And Elijah saw it, and he cried, My father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. And he saw him no more, and he took hold of his own clothes, and rent them in two pieces. He took up also the mantle of Elijah that fell from him, and went back and stood by the bank of Jordan. And he took the mantle of Elijah that fell from him, and smote the waters, and said, Where is the Lord God of Elijah? And when he also had smitten the waters, they parted hither and thither, and Elijah went on. Oh, I oh. Went over. Do you guys see a pattern already? Do you see a pattern already? Already Elijah, he was following, who was he following? Elijah. And he, he knew how awesome, he knew how powerful Elijah was. He saw him do great signs and wonders. Were following him. He was a known prophet in Israel. And Elijah is saying, I need to know God that you're with me. And what does God use again? A certain location, the Jordan River. And he takes off the mantle and he, and he wants to see for himself. It, let this be a sign, God, if you're with me. And he takes the mantle, he throws it in the water and the water split. The water split. When he took off the mantle, threw it in the ground. Another sign, God chose the Jordan River as a certain location to make himself known and to confirm a calling on his chosen vessel. And you can see this, the Jordan River is showing up in the Bible over and over and over and over. And I just picked out a few significant events that I thought were uh, amazing. In 2 Kings chapter 5, verses 12, 13, and 14... God is amazing in the way that he operates. He leaves little clues. Do you know if someone commits a murder, a real good detective can find out who committed the murder without being there. What's some of the evidence that someone could leave behind? Fingerprints, hair follicles, an article of clothing, a shoe print, DNA, evidence. 
A murderer will leave evidence whether he wants to or not. That's how people get caught all the time. Forensics, they call it. Forensic science. People know how to investigate and discover who the murderer was. Well, as Christians, there's forensic science. There's evidence in the Bible of how to determine when God's hand is in something. Again, he uses the Jordan River. That is God's chosen river to perform miracles. And how many times did this man get dipped in the river? Seven times. The number seven is symbolic for God's divinity. It's like God is leaving evidence in his word to show this is my pattern. And I'm going to tell you, even in your life, when you do certain things, you go and purchase something and you see 7777 on your receipt. It's God's way of saying, hey, I'm with you. There was a time where uh, I had one day, I saw the number 7 every single where I went. I went to uh, Aldi's and bought some groceries. My receipt was 7, the change was like $7.77 or the purchase of it. The price of it was $7.77. Then I got in my car and I pulled behind a guy who had a license plate, 777 Seven, seven, and then I looked at my speedometer in my car. Seven, seven, seven. It was like the one day everywhere. Then I went on my motorcycle. Seven, seven, seven. I took pictures of it just to prove it. And it was like God was really trying to speak to me. And I'm going to tell you, that's the beauty of his word, is that the more you read it, the more you uh, start to see certain patterns of evidence that God is doing certain things. And if you can pick it out in the Word of God, if you can pick out God operating certain patterns, like the Jordan River, the number seven, you can pick out certain things in the Bible, then you can pick it out in your own personal life. And you can pick it out in the lives of those around you. You can see God's hand operating. And then you have Naaman. Naaman, again, he did not want to be healed and the Jordan River. He said there's lots of other rivers uh, of Damascus that are way better than the Jordan River. He didn't like the Jordan River. There are a lot of people that just don't like the way God operates because their pride, because of their understanding, because they think that God should operate at their place where they want God to be. But God said, no, I've chosen again the Jordan River. And what did God do? He told he told the prophet what to tell Naaman. He told the prophet exactly, he said, go and tell him to go to the Jordan River. And that's where healings took place. So the Jordan River represents new boundaries. It represents God's promises. And it also represents God's healing. God heals people in the Jordan River. And God's healings don't always come about the way we think they should be. John the Baptist, the, way, the uh, cousin of Jesus, he baptized folks in the Jordan River. And John the Baptist, he had a lifestyle that was a little peculiar. Anyone agree or disagree? You think everyone was eating uh, locusts and honey back then? You don't think anyone has some fish sandwiches or some pita bread? John lived not like everyone else. John, you can call John the Baptist, with all due respect, he was peculiar. He was peculiar. He wasn't trying to blend in with everyone else. Even the people, the Pharisees and the scribes, when they saw him baptizing, they didn't quite understand John. And I believe it was the King Herod who wanted, or the, the wife of him who wanted the head of John Baptist on a silver platter. But again, God repeated himself. Now this is in the New Testament. You have the Old Testament uh, miracle, miracle, new boundaries, promised land, God's promises, a new life. A new life. These people in Israel, they came from slavery. They were bound in Egypt. All the way up to the Jordan River to a land flowing with what? Milk and honey. A whole new lifestyle. When you get to a certain point in God, God can set a certain point in your life and when you trust Him and you step out in faith and you cross that Jordan River, God can change your whole entire life and provide you with milk and honey. Something that you weren't used to. Something that you weren't accommodated to. 
But you have to cross your comfort zone. You have to cross what you're used to. You have to step out in faith. And then God will produce miracles. So God was baptizing folks in the Jordan River. And when they came up, it represented a new life. A new life. In Mark chapter 1, verses 9, we'll do Sister Tammy. We went a little bit out of order. Sister Tammy, Mark chapter 1, verses 9 and 10. And it came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized of John in Jordan. Ten and straightway coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens open and the spirit like a dove descending upon him. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, our Lord and Savior, the King of Kings, was baptized in Kalahari Water Park and SeaWorld and Lake Erie. Jesus Christ, the King of Kings, was baptized by John the Baptist in the Jordan River. And that's where Jesus Christ received the Holy Spirit. And that was what God, what did God do when Jesus Christ received the Holy Spirit? He gave God confirmation. He gave Jesus Christ confirmation. He said, this is my son whom I am well pleased. Again, God gave confirmation of his new calling in the Jordan River. And at that point, Jesus, he went on with his ministry, filled with the Holy Spirit, God living inside of him, anointed by the Father in heaven. And here you have a real picture of a more current time, not 2,000 years ago when Jesus was baptized. You have a more current picture in the year 2000 of people being baptized to this day in the Jordan River. Now my question is to you in Cleveland, Ohio. Do you need to go to the Jordan River to get in touch with God? No. Do you need to be baptized in the Jordan River to be saved? No. All you need to do is believe on Jesus Christ Ask Him to forgive you for your sins. Forgive other people for hurting you and doing you wrong. And the Bible says that you'll be born again. You'll be saved. And you ask God to fill you with the Holy Spirit. And He will. He will. But the Jordan River is a very special place. But symbolically, if you don't have a physical opportunity to go to the Jordan River. You don't have a physical, literal opportunity to be bapt in the jo Jordan River and to cross the Jordan River. God will give us all a Jordan River in our own life that he will ask us to cross. God will give us all a Jordan River where we can be baptized and born again. And it will be a monumental, life-changing moment and place. My Jordan River was in the Justice Center. When I went to the Justice Center, I went in on the other side of the Justice Center as an atheist, heathen, no good, wicked individual. I came out of the Justice Center a Christian, born again, filled with the Holy Spirit, delivered from drugs and alcohol with a new spirit, a new mind, a new purpose, a new goal. Where is your Jordan River? In the Hebrew, some meanings relating and connecting to the word Jordan River, to the words Jordan River, is to break out, to burst forth. Used a river breaking out of its source, a child issuing from the womb. It's as a child is being born. It's bursting out of the fluid, the water. It's coming forward from the water into a new life, a new purpose, a new goal. 
And so will we when we become born again. And the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 17... Does everyone know Does everyone know what happens to a caterpillar? It goes through a metamorphosis. Its nature of the caterpillar is to be destructive. To eat everything. Caterpillars were used by God as plagues. I believe I was a plague before I was a Christian. I was a destructive I was eating up everything, contributing nothing. That's what caterpillars do to vegetation. They just destroy things. But a caterpillar at one point in time goes through a metamorphosis and it changes its very nature and it becomes a, a butterfly that pollinates vegetation. Whereas one point in one stage in its life, when it was crawling on the ground eating mud, it was destructive, and the next stage of its life, it's pollinizing, producing. And so we will too as we become born again. All things become new. Behold. When you become a Christian, when you become a new creature in Christ, people will come up to you and say, you're not who you used to be. You are not the same. You're not the same person who I know. There's something different about you. People will notice a change. Believe me, if you crawl and you're like a worm, and then the next moment you're flying and your colors have changed, people notice it. And they will too when you cross the Jordan River. They will notice that there's something different about you. When you become a Christian, don't allow the devil to beat you down by the things that Jesus Christ has forgiven you for. You don't need to go back to him. You don't need to go into self-condemnation. And you don't need to go into self-justification for the sin that you've done. You don't need to justify the sin. And you don't need to condemn yourself by the sin nor allow others to. You're covered under the blood of Christ. You press forward. You forget the past. You move forward. God has new things. You can't have your foot in the past and the future at the same time. Well, if you're really going to advance in Christ, if you're going to grow spiritually, you have to move forward. You have to move forward. In Joshua chapter 5, verses 1, the Bible says, And it came to pass when all the kings of the Amorites, which were on the side of the Jordan westward, and all the kings of the Canaanites, which were by the sea, heard the Lord had dried up the waters. The Jordan from before the children of Israel, until we passed over it, that their hearts melted. And neither was their spirit in them anymore because of the children of Israel. So here you have witnesses of the people of God who God performed the miracle and dried up the Jordan River. There were witnesses. And it says that their hearts melted because they knew God was with them and not with them. And I'm going to tell you, as you really grow in Christ, there's going to be witness of people who are not for you but against you, and they will have nothing but your demise in their imagination. They will have nothing but your destruction in their heart's desires. They will want you to be destroyed, and God will cause you to be favored and blessed and promoted.